In a previous video, I discussed the harmonic distortions that can be found with analog EQs, compressors, and tape machines, and how they helped to shape the sound of music throughout history. In this video, we'll take a closer look at two of the most iconic analog compressors in music production, the Universal Audio 1176 and the LA-2A, and how those analog compressors have been reborn as plug-in emulations that can now be used in a DAW session. There are so many variables when comparing compressors. Use the free trial link in the description below this video so that you can hear for yourself the unique characteristics of each of the compressors I'm about to show you. The 1176, for example, is capable of extremely short attack times, down to about 20 microseconds. This proposes a serious obstacle for making a plug-in emulation of the 1176 because 20 microseconds is even shorter than the sample length at a 44.1 kHz sample rate. Therefore, it's a bit difficult to detect the amplitude of the signal and control the gain within that extremely short period of time. However, as you can see in this measurement, the UA plug-in emulation on the bottom is just as quick as the reissue model on top and the original unit in the middle. The figure on the left shows the test signal, which was used to observe the attack behavior of these compressors. It's a sine wave whose gain is increased by 20 decibels at a positive going zero crossing. The figure on the right shows the response of each compressor with the attack time set as low as possible. For comparison's sake, the shortest attack time available on the Precision Channel Strip Compressor is 0 0.05 milliseconds, or 50 microseconds, more than double that of the 1176. The program-dependent release of the 1176 is also iconic. This means that the time it takes the compressor to stop compressing after a quick transient will be different from the release time after compressing a more tonal signal. The graph on the left shows the release time after a transient input signal, compared to the graph on the right, which shows the release time after a steady state or tonal signal. Notice that the release is much more gradual after a steady state input compared to the release time after a transient input. Let's look at this in a different way. On the left-hand side, you see the test signal, which contains a very quick burst of signal followed by low level, then a longer burst of signal, again followed by low level. On the right side, you can see how each compressor reacts to this signal. Following the very short burst of signal, each compressor recovers relatively quickly with a relatively quick attack. However, after the long burst of signal, each compressor takes a bit longer to recover from that compression. This has big implications for how a compressor would sound on a drum kit compared to a bass DI compared to a vocal. Typically, digital compressors simply don't have this sort of nuanced behavior. You need analog hardware or plug-in emulations of analog hardware for that. Another important nuance of analog compression can be found in the equally iconic Universal Audio LA-2A. This also has a unique program-dependent release, but in addition to that, it exhibits frequency-dependent compression threshold and ratio. Look at this graph and notice that A, the compression begins earlier for some frequencies and later for others, but the compression also B intensifies at different rates for each frequency as the signal goes further beyond the threshold. Again, you can see by comparing these two graphs that the developers at Universal Audio created plug-in emulations of the LA-2A that exhibit insanely realistic behavior compared to the original hardware. If we run this same test on a more typical digital compressor, like the Precision Channel Strip, we'll see that the compression curve is identical for each of these four frequencies. This is just another example of the very unique and nuanced behavior of analog circuits compared to a simple digital algorithm that doesn't account for these infinitely small details. And for those of us who were born into this industry with such advanced analog emulations already on the market, I think it's important for us to realize just how incredible it is that these nuances can be so accurately captured and packaged into a plugin. Back in the early days of digital audio, most plugins just carried out a relatively simple mathematical task to achieve the desired function. Don't get me wrong, this was still incredible technology for the time, but these days plugins are much more sophisticated. What used to cost thousands of dollars for a single channel can now be applied across multiple channels at a fraction of the cost which is mind-boggling if you really stop and think about it. 
I invited Universal Audio to sponsor this series of videos on analog versus digital because they're a company that excels in both domains. They produce iconic hardware, including compressors, preamps, and audio interfaces, but at the same time, they create some of the best plugins on the market. In the next video, we'll explore some of the benefits and drawbacks of using plugin emulations of analog gear versus the analog gear itself.